Good morning. My name is Jason Spazano. I'm the Director of Cybersecurity here at Gramatech, and today we're honored to be part of the CSFI Spotlight Program. I'm accompanied today by Alexei Loganoff, our VP of Research. Alexei, you want to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Alexei Loganoff. I'm the Vice President of Research at Gramatech. I've been here for about 12 years. Prior to that, I worked at Hewlett Packard and IBM Research. Uh, and for my education, I got a PhD in static analysis at uh, the University of Wisconsin, uh, focusing on a lot of similar things that I work on now. Thanks, Alexei. Uh, just some uh, background on Gramatech. Uh, Gramatech was founded in 1988 by academics with a focus on program analysis and, and program transformation. And today we have about 20 PhD experts and a solid engineering team, and we're located in two areas. One, our corporate headquarters is in Bethesda, Maryland, and then our development and research center is located in Ithaca, New York. And so our expertise is in software analysis and binary transformation, and that's built upon I guess since it was started in 1988, you know, decades of cutting end research with uh, the government and other organizations. So fundamentally, you know, our mission is to increase the security of software and firmware, but it's focused on four general areas. And for that, I'll hand it back over to Alexei to elaborate. Yes. Uh, so one of the areas we focus on is software assurance, where the goal is to develop new techniques and technologies for analyzing software to ensure runtime integrity, prevent system breaches, security breaches, failures. Uh, and um, uh, as another area that we focus a great deal of attention on is reverse engineering, where the goal is to uh, understand binaries, uh, uh, perform vulnerability research, understand low-level behaviors, uh, and to allow cybersecurity teams to investigate and reuse processes to evaluate software for cyber vulnerabilities, as well as to remediate these vulnerabilities. Software hardening um, is uh, uh, a collection of binary rewriting techniques that focus on improving binaries resilience, survivability, and security. Uh, we also work on autonomic monitoring and protection, where the goal is to uh, monitor uh, complex systems for domain-specific properties, uh, monitor their behavior, and uh, and respond appropriately if uh, the behavior deviates from norms. Uh, and finally, one of the more high-level goals that we're focusing on is software producibility. So the idea is to try to simplify, automate, and improve the process of software construction. So automatically construct software uh, or automatically repair and improve it. So, Alexa, you've been here, as you noted, for 12 years, and given where we are now with our research areas, how has that evolved kind of over time to where we are now? Yes, great question. Uh, and the company has been around for 32 years now, so uh, I'll, uh, uh, in a sentence or two, I'll summarize uh, its existence prior, you know, in the 20 years prior to me joining. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, early on, you know, one of the first uh, things that the company focused on, uh, that uh, the two founding um, members uh, worked on, Tim Teitelbaum and uh, Tom Reps, was uh, an early version of um, developing IDE, integrated development environments. From that, we went into program understanding, trying to understand what a large complex body of source code does. Soon after that, the importance of binaries uh, for security um, b became obvious, uh, as most uh, software is delivered in binary form only, especially to the government. And we started focusing on reverse engineering, understanding what happens in a binary, how secure it is. Uh, once we got some capabilities in understanding some uh, so things about binary and source code, uh, we started getting into discovering vulnerabilities and analyzing what kinds of security problems may arise in, in source or binaries. After that, um, we uh, it became clear that the next thing to work on was to try to uh, validate that these vulnerabilities are real. So we started getting into some dynamic techniques to uh, prove out that uh, a given tentative vulnerability report is truly a, a serious a exploitable vulnerability. And we got into a lot of dynamic techniques like fuzzing, symbolic execution, and the like. Uh, from there, uh, the next step was obviously to try to mitigate these vulnerabilities. And we learned how to transform binaries to remove 
uh, vulnerabilities or to apply generic protections like, let's say, control flow integrity that just improve the resilience of a binary uh, overall. Uh, and uh, most recently, uh, we um, started um, uh, uh, trying to solve uh, uh, these, uh, these same problems in novel ways. And as many others, we are looking in, uh, into some very novel techniques using machine learning, statistical techniques, data mining, and the use of uh, big code, as we call it. So the use of all the vast amount of useful uh, uh, information in the form of, let's say, uh, correct code on GitHub, and using that to inspire a better use of code or synthesis of new correct code. Uh, and in addition to all of these, we also have uh, a, a, an interesting collection of efforts on hardware security, where we focus on uh, finding Trojans and uh, uh, subtle behaviors in uh, FPGAs, for instance. Um, so uh, this, uh, uh, you know, our successes uh, moves from uh, small contracts uh, like SBIRs and STTRs, little by little, onto being able to compete for larger, uh, more important uh, uh, undertakings like um, um, broad agency announcements. Uh, I believe that one of our first major ones, uh, maybe this was our second, but the, the first big one was a BAA from IARPA. Uh, called Stone Soup. Stone Soup stands for. Uh, <laughs> I love the names. I know. Uh, Stone Soup stands for securely taking on executable software of unknown providence. Um, <laughs> the goal there was simple um, try to take an arbitrary binary, understand what kind of vulnerabilities it has, uh, try to mitigate, remove these vulnerabilities, and then try to diversify binaries so that you can execute multiple copies at the same time. And uh, if the behavior between these different copies varies or diverges, then it may be that the system is under attack and there needs to be another round of correction. So now, this was a well, Alexei, that work was kind of the precursor into our foray into the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge, correct? Exactly. And so our work in identifying vulnerabilities, correcting them, uh, and applying a variety of techniques for correcting and applying a, a variety of techniques of identifying vulnerabilities with certainty. That's what enabled us to uh, uh, to win funding for DARPA Cyber, Cyber Grand Challenge. And uh, we actually got second place. We're partnered with uh, University of Virginia. We worked on, um, uh, so the goal in, in that program um, was to find vulnerabilities, to mitigate them, and simultaneously to attack other solutions to the problem. So a number of teams had systems that were fully autonomic competing against each other. And so our goal was not only to protect our uh, uh, bodies that weren't trusted to us, but also uh, to attack others and, and take their, their defenses down. Uh, and we got second place, which is a, a wonderful accomplishment for, for this open competition. So Jason, maybe let's tag team on this question. Uh, I've been here uh, a bit longer than you, so I'm curious uh, how you feel our company stands out. Um, yeah, so I think there's four four areas that kind of stand out to me. Uh, first one being um, two aspects, uh, strong research and cutting edge development, and that's both the commercial and research side. And uh, for a small business, I think that's uh, of about 100 people. I think that's good. And I'll uh, talk or talk to that a little bit more here. Second one be, be, uh, would be uh, research depth. Um, third, longstanding relationships with customers, which to me builds to trust that's been established. And the fourth is strategic teaming and partnerships. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But with respect to the commercial and research side, uh, as I mentioned, we're a company of about 100 people and maintain a research division. As some of those technologies get transitioned, it has lent strength that our commercial division stands on its own, right? So Code Sarner's a good example of a technology that we transition, which is a static application security testing tool for source and binaries. It essentially looks at uh, code, um, and design flaws for bugs and vulnerabilities. And particularly as, you know, uh, DevSecOps is being fully integrated into the defense and Intel space, that's a tool that's integral to making that happen. Uh, 
Um, and so we've done, what, over 150 research projects over the years, civilian defense, intel agencies. I think one of the things that's interesting is, you know, our team's pretty selective about what we go after. They look at a problem and how we approach it and ensure that we can be successful. And so our win rates are well over 50 percent, which in and of itself, I think, just alludes to the the way we go about solving a problem and making sure that what we go after that that we can be successful on it. And um, and and as I talked to already from the commercial side of it, we strive to transition our early research capabilities to commercial uh, capabilities. And sometimes uh, it's successful. It takes a lot of work to make sure what has been a research arm that's not as close to operational capabilities as that TR level matures, you wanna make sure and understand how the capability is gonna be utilized, how the tool is gonna to be um, uh, used to solve a problem, and you hone it to make sure it's a viable commercial capability. And I think we've done a good job at doing that. And so, Alexi, I'll hand off the research depth to you because that's certainly one you can uh, answer better than I. Yes, we certainly have a unique um, research breadth and depth. Uh, I alluded to breadth earlier, uh, the, the number of areas we cover to try to uh, create holistic solutions to software cybersecurity problems. Uh, and depth is particularly important for us. Uh, we look for new approaches to problems. For instance, a few years back when we started uh, finding the limitations of uh, vulnerability research using just static and dynamic analysis, we started engaging in uh, some machine learning, statistical, and big data techniques to uh, find uh, uh, more powerful approaches to certain uh, to certain issues. Uh, for example, we have technology for fingerprinting uh, code that is uh, that incorporates a CVE uh, in a way that allows us to detect uh, that code in a new uh, in, when it's incorporated into a new binary with very high precision, something like 98, 99% in a matter of a second or two. And that's a, that's a very important, powerful capability that's unique that uh, where we have, uh, where we've taken the machine learning approaches much further than uh, the state of the art at the time. So Alexi, in terms of that, so if you have a CVE that's built differently, it has the ability to find it in its multiple variations, correct? Exactly. So uh, we uh, fingerprint both kind of syntactic and semantic features uh, that are uh, uh, telltale signs of this CVE in a way that allows us to detect it uh, when it's incorporated, when this, let's say, open source package container, the CVE, is incorporated into a brand new uh, program compiled with some previously unused uh, collection of flags on some uh, obscure compiler and still have a, a very high chance of detecting that rapidly and precisely. Yes, good, good question. Uh, similarly, we take our work in uh, identifying vulnerabilities and take it further to validate that these are truly uh, actual vulnerabilities that uh, could in fact be exploited. Uh, and then we uh, uh, patch them uh, in a way that uh, allows us to, to have uh, significant confidence that the, the new program behaves exactly as before, as it's expected to behave on all benign inputs, but uh, is not does not fall prey to whatever might attack that vulnerability. Uh, finally, we, uh, we are uh, doing a great deal of work in program synthesis where we uh, uh, are uh, looking at ways to uh, mutate programs to correct existing bugs, to migrate programs from using some older API to a new one, uh, uh, mostly automatically, and even create, uh, fully automatically create significant snippets of code to start building systems uh, using uh, program systems synthesis and evolution uh, with, uh, uh, with just interaction with a human with significant automation. Uh, thanks, Alexi. Uh, the third, I guess, item we had talked about was one planning relationships with customers, which to me alludes to the trust that's been built. And so, you know, our team, um, as I alluded to, most of our customers now have been kind of longstanding. Not all of them because you look to find new customers, but uh, I think in terms of the ones where we've had long-standing relationships with, the, the trust has been built in terms of how you 
the ability to deliver, certainly, uh, the ability to work through complex problems and personalities, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, all of these things, you know, people are involved. So the ability to deal through problems, challenges, and such, we've been able to do that. It's not always successful, right? Because you're dealing with really smart people. In many cases, they have very uh, different thought processes sometime to go about it. And uh, sometimes it's successful, but not always. But we've had a really good uh, ability to work through it and be successful. And then fundamentally, you know, uh, we're fortunate enough that they come back to us and we continue to get more work. And we're very blessed to have that. So uh, and in terms of that, you know, when we look at teaming and partnerships, um, whether it's academia, whether it's industry, or just organizations that are on the cutting edge of solving a problem. We're very selective in who we go after, but in terms of who we partner with, that's also lent itself to uh, a longstanding partnerships and the trust that's built. Because for us, you know, that's important. Because again, you know, at the end of the day, companies are people, and those relationships that you form are very important going forward and how you work together. Yes, and so we work with uh, a number of industrial and academic partners, like Jason said, uh, whenever a new important problem arises, we uh, uh, we figure out what is the best team to build to, to address a problem. And we have long-standing relationships with, with, with a number of uh, small research organizations and, uh, um, uh, and big defense primes, as well as academic partners at the top universities like MIT, CMU, Stanford, UT Austin, University of Virginia, Georgia Tech, to help us uh, find the best groundbreaking solutions uh, to a problem uh, and, uh, and, and pursue it in, uh, in any long partnership. Okay. Can you highlight some of your technologies that are ready for transition to the commercial marketplace that you're excited about? Yes, uh, I'll tell you about four such capabilities. Um, in, for each, I'll tell you a little bit about the challenges we're trying to solve with these uh, and some of the interesting innovations and capabilities that are unique to, to these capabilities. Uh, so in the first, we focus on firmware. Uh, so this is uh, software that resides on um, embedded devices, um, things that control uh, uh, industrial control systems like nuclear reactors military systems like weapon systems, navigation systems, and everyday applications like automotive controls, medical devices, and IoT devices. In all of these, the big challenge is that uh, it's very difficult to evaluate things on the real system. Uh, the hardware may be expensive to procure, or uh, you know we may risk breaking it if we try to evaluate uh, um, its behavior thoroughly. Uh, and certainly there's danger in evaluating things like uh, weapon systems in their full operating mode. The capability that's, uh, that's you know, the key innovation here that we bring is uh, to try to extract uh, important software components, components that uh, uh, manipulate something sensitive or are in other ways, uh, you know, safety or security critical and uh, re-host them on perfectly normal systems like Linux or Windows and be able to analyze their behaviors very thoroughly on those systems while virtualizing or kind of stubbing out any interactions with the hardware that we're not trying to trigger. Uh, and so if we're able to find zero days, so brand new vulnerabilities, or end days, known vulnerabilities in these components, and then we validate that we're actually able to trigger them in this virtualized environment, that's a strong signal that uh, the actual final complete system is is vulnerable and is risky to deploy. Uh, and uh, you know, if we confirm that that's the case, we then uh, can uh, uh, employ a uh, capability to take out a given component and replace it with a safer, more secure component that allows us to patch the system uh, and uh, you know uh, have it be in better shape for deployment. So, Alexei. You can take uh, firmware that you have limited knowledge about, extract kind of security relevant components from the firmware. Do you have the ability to rank them kind of uh, worst to first from the analyst perspective so you can isolate those portions with the biggest risk? Yes, so we have a, a great deal of uh, um, powerful heuristics and analysis built in to allow us to uh, rank what should be of most interest uh, uh, to the analyst. 
uh, perhaps because uh, it interacts with uh, very sensitive uh, hardware or be perhaps because it has extensive uh, um, um, uh, number of vulnerabilities. Uh, we uh, provide a great deal of automation as well as we uh, give the analyst control to, to, to change some decisions, to adjust some of the uh, uh, conclusions that the tool came to in a, a very interesting kind of a data science-like environment. Uh, we use JupyterLab notebooks for those who care, uh, for those who know what that technology is, um, that allows the, uh, the software, the automation, to cooperate with the analyst to build a combined uh, system and documentation workflow that can be reproduced in the future and kind of builds, uh, uh, improves the automation and improves the analyst's understanding of, of the system and how to do these tasks in the future. So in terms of reproducibility and the gradual automation of workflows, I mean, that's a big component of it, but not only that, if you have the, the ability to automate the, the tooling from the reverse engineering perspective, the uh, analysis process, the ability to reduce the level of skill sets required and or the time it takes to get it done, those two things are are big outside of the reproducibility component. Yes, absolutely. So this is, uh, it's uh, uh, lowering the skill required, it's uh, improving automation and uh, kind of and building up these workflows that can be used in the future. This is all in the interest of speeding up this process uh speeding up the process of discovering flaws and vulnerabilities and remediating them all right our second capability focuses on finding unknown security vulnerabilities in a given system to be deployed uh, prior to deploying obviously it's uh, it targets uh, more traditional uh, windows and linux uh, desktop and um, enterprise applications and systems uh, and uh, this capability consists of six different phases in the first phase, uh, we uh, the first phase is error amplification. The second phase is weakness discovery. The third phase is, is exploitability analysis. Then we have binary patching, binary hardening, and validation. And let me just tell you a couple of things about each of these. Uh, the goal of error amplification is to modify the binary, so to use our binary transformation techniques to make it much more likely that any latent problem in this binary manifests as an actual visible uh, problem, such as a crash. Uh, and uh, the second phase is weakness discovery, where we use fuzzing and uh, symbolic execution to try to uh, make it much more likely that we discover uh, inputs that uh, cause these bizarre behaviors, cause these unexpected behaviors, uh, memory corruptions, and the like. Uh, the third phase takes these crashing inputs and tries to understand how exploitable are the, the bugs that underlie these, uh, uh, these crashes. For instance, we may uh, an attacker might have over a, uh, a, a, a uh, jump in the, in the code, so like over the control transfer. Next, we have binary patching. So once we deem one of the uh, vulnerabilities to be more severe, we may apply a patch to eliminate this exact vulnerability so that uh, uh, something benign happens when uh, an input that triggers it is, uh, occurs. Like for example, growing the buffer size that might otherwise be overrun in memory. Next, we apply more generic binary hardening techniques if that's uh, beneficial, where we, um, uh, try to apply generic protections that uh, may help us withstand, may help the application withstand an arbitrary attack on a, uh, based on a vulnerability that hasn't been identified. And finally, uh, we have some techniques for validation, such as regression testing to ensure that normal benign behaviors uh, on benign inputs are not affected. So Alexi, if I was gonna succinctly summarize this capability, it aggressively identifies primarily zero-day vulnerabilities, then identifies the level of security risk associated with them, enabling patching to eliminate vulnerabilities or hardening to mitigate the potential residual risk with those vulnerabilities. Is that appropriate sum summary? 
Yes, that, that's very good, yes. And patching allows uh, mitigation against potential even residual other vulnerabilities. Okay. The next uh, um, capability I'd like to tell you about uh, is very exciting uh, and new. Um, it uses a lot of interesting machine learning uh, technology. Um, the basic problem we're trying to solve in this capability, with this capability, um, reflects today's reality. Uh, in a recent study, uh, it was found that open source components make up uh, often up to 90% of a given system's code, with only 10% of the code being written for specific to a given application. This just reflects the reality that uh, producing new code is costly, that a great deal of useful code has already been produced and uh, put in the open source or other shared domains. Uh, and that is uh, silly both for cost and security reasons to reinvent the wheel every time, so to speak. Now, the challenge here is that uh, uh, all of these shared components have known vulnerabilities. Uh, and many of them critical. They're well publicized as CVEs in the National Vulnerability Database, et cetera. Um, and uh, uh, attackers know that these exist. Attackers can guess what components may be embedded in a, an important security sensitive uh, application and can take advantage of that. What we'd like to do is find these CVEs uh, or find components with CVEs and other vulnerabilities quickly and precisely. Existing uh, tool chains that try to do something like this uh, usually focus on byte patterns. So the, the idea is you just look at uh, the exact bytes of a given component, and if you find them, the, uh, that's an indication you have a problem. The challenge is that these components are baked into new applications compiled with new compilers, with new compiler flags, new optimization levels, and uh, uh, the uh, open source compatible components never look the same. So our key innovation is to use both syntactic and semantic features. So syntactic uh, uh, features are, you know, what the code looks like, its shape, and semantic features, what does the code manipulate, how, what does it do? Uh, in a way that allows us to uh, uh, to apply the technique generically, despite the fact that great variations in the uh, code is uh, 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 the great variations happen to the uh, binary that's embedded the the open source binary, and uh, with this we essentially fingerprint the component that allows us to find it inside an application inside a binary very fast and with very high precision. Again, I'm talking seconds and with you know, 98, 99% certainty that we identified all and nothing but the, uh, the uh, um, vulnerable components. Uh, and um, uh, I guess um, this capability is uh, clearly... So Alexi, following up on a comment you made earlier that up to 90% of the application is using open source code. Do developers really understand the risk uh, in utilizing that much open source? Uh, not entirely. Uh, there are many statistics that discuss these numbers in more detail. Um, and uh, there are examples uh, that uh, there, are, there are studies in the last uh, couple of years that indicate that uh, oftentimes, or I guess it's just shy of 300 open source components that is the average number of components that's made use of in a given binary application. And uh, uh, what's interesting is that the number of direct dependencies, the number of things that the developers include explicitly is much smaller uh, on the order of maybe 60 to 90. So, you know, three quarters, two thirds to three quarters of the open source components that are actually brought in underneath as part of the the build process, are kind of below the, the below the water level, so to speak. Like if you imagine the iceberg uh, analogy. So with that, the developers don't even know that they could be subject to the problems uh, of these implicitly brought in uh, code and dependencies. Uh, and this, but this is the reality of DevOps and DevSecOps. You need to produce code quickly. You need to. Uh, you, you know, every line that you write needs to be for something important. You're not going to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and so this trajectory 
uh, you know, this this trend is only going to continue growing. Yeah, the implication is the ability to test for vulnerabilities and components at every release, right? Yes, yes, and um, so the uh, the number of components, the percentage of the open source code will keep growing, um, and that's a good trend because um, oh, I mean, there's no sense in writing code from scratch. There's no sense in introducing brand new vulnerabilities. Um, when, you have, when you're able to rely on open source code. But of course, open source code has high visibility and attackers do study it carefully to try to find how to, how to find weaknesses in it and how to attack it. So the, the key is not to shift away from make, making use of open source components. The key is to try to figure out how to maintain its security, quickly identify problems and mitigate them. Alexi, just to reiterate something we talked about, before you went over the four capabilities, each of these are at a mature stage, correct? Yes, these are some of our most mature capabilities that are ready to transition both into uh, the government, defense, and uh, industrial settings, and we're eager to have them have an impact on uh, your security needs. So what are some emerging capabilities that you'd like to highlight? Uh, good question. So uh, overall, I think in terms of uh, the things we do looking forward, we uh, focus on a lot of aspects of automating the process of software construction, maintenance, and all aspects of the software development lifecycle. Uh, for instance, under one program, uh, we are focused on certification and recertification of software. Certification is the process of evaluating that a software system's risk is acceptable, uh, and this, uh, the process of certifying and recertifying software within the DoD is uh, very expensive because of the amount of expertise it requires, the amount of time it takes. It's also error prone because the level of uh, uh, assurance that's provided by different uh, uh, experts uh, varies. What uh, we're trying to do is uh, uh, decompose the process of software certification to uh, evaluate uh, different components one at a time, build up evidence about their uh, compliance with the needed uh, 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 properties, and then synthesize that into assurance cases that, uh, that certify the sum total of these components. So in summary, we're uh, uh, working on techniques to automate the process of generating evidence uh, for individual components, especially legacy binary components, synthesizing that into coherent, comprehensive uh, assurance cases for, for the complete systems, uh, thus speeding up, uh, really, uh, reducing the error uh, um, uh, susceptibility and uh, increasing the confidence in the assurance cases for large complex software systems. In another exciting program, we uh, work on the problem of maintenance and sustainment of uh, software. Uh, there's a real problem in that uh, the DoD often creates software that is meant to last a decade or longer, maybe multiple decades. But of course, the decisions that were made in the construction of the software may change over time. And uh, there's a desire to try to figure out how to infer intent in software construction and separate that from the concrete implementation. So, uh, for example, uh, maybe uh, at the time of constructing software, an uh, a developer chooses a certain size for a data structure, reflecting how much space they have totally they have available in memory. And uh, but this decision gets hard coded into the code. We'd like to be able to analyze this, infer the intent that the developer had uh, a certain proportion of the memory in mind when making this choice, and be able to adapt to software when the environment, the constraints, resource availability change over time. And so this problem of continually adapting, continually extending, modernizing, and maintaining the software uh, is, a, um, is a serious need that we're trying to address with a broad collection of uh, statistical machine learning techniques, program synthesis, and uh, code search techniques that are uh, very novel uh, and exciting. Uh, so modernizing both the software and test case construction uh, for uh, for maintainability of software long term. In another program, our focus shifts to uh, software as it's getting deployed. So for large software systems, 
uh, there are many configuration parameters that are available for the various components, especially for the DoD, a large system like, for instance, all the software that's on a, uh, a naval ship uh, is comprised of many different components that each can be configured appropriately or inappropriately for the different scenarios that, this, that the uh, ship may operate in, such as at dock during maintenance versus uh, uh, at sea during operations. So we, uh, our focus on this program is to characterize attacks for stemming from uh, different configurations of components and then developing approaches to remedy these weaknesses via uh, changed or refined configurations. An exciting effort that we start uh, very soon focuses on development of a portable standards compliant network stack for 5G mobile. So here we uh, work on open source and secure by design network stack. The advantage of using open source software is increased code visibility, allowing the code to be examined, analyzed, audited, be it manually or through um, automated tools. And uh, this would allow us to is a plug and play approach where we can combine different elements of software and hardware and reduce the risk uh, that uh, may come from the reliance on untrusted or uh, open source hardware components incorporated into the overall system. So how will your company help shape the future of our American national security? Well, in a nutshell, I think more, much of what we work on can be thought of as automating uh, the most difficult and expensive aspects of software construction. Our mature capabilities look to identify and eliminate vulnerabilities in software. The goal is to speed up the process of security evaluation and remediation, to lower the need for critical human expertise, and to lower the cost and risk of software construction and its deployment. Looking forward, we're finding ways to create software automatically and efficiently to make it, uh, to make it secure, reliable, testable, and maintainable. Yeah, so if you look at the traditional ways of building software over long periods of time, and for that matter, high costs, I mean, I think uh, a lot of the things that we do focus on the reduction of high-end skill sets, uh, the remediation or the automating or speeding up the process of evaluation and remediation ultimately helps make quicker actionable decisions right which improves overall security but ultimately impacts the cost right so in this case it's people it's the actual cost relative to time and then 